Okay. Okay. Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, please sign into the attendance if you can. Um, let's see. A couple of you emailed me to ask about the uh, Bill Cosby case last week. So um, the way the Supreme Court usually works is thousands of people every year petition for what's called a writ of certiorari. Right, they want the Supreme Court to take their case. Thousands of petitions. On average, the Supreme Court grants maybe 70, 75, 65 a year. Very small number. But sometimes when the court declines to hear a case, a justice will write an opinion. What? The justice will complain saying, you know what, we really should have taken this case, or we shouldn't take this case but maybe we'll take another case. These are opinions called dissents from denial of certiorari, or you have concurrences from denial of certiorari, or statements concerning the denial of certiorari. They have no value by themselves, right? They're not actually precedential. But generally the justices are complaining that either we should have taken this case, or we should take a similar case in the future. Uh, these are not published opinions, but they do get published. Um, last week, uh, the Supreme Court considered a case involving um, Bill Cosby. And there was a woman who accused Cosby of a sexual assault. Cosby then sued her for defamation, saying it was false. Okay. Uh, the person who Cosby sued wasn't anyone particularly famous, but the argument was that because she injected herself into this um, huge Bill Cosby firestorm, she became a public figure. And because she was a public figure, the actual malice standard from New York Times versus Sullivan applied, right? And the case can't go forward this way, right? It's very hard to make a case under actual malice. That's the law. Justice Thomas wrote an opinion, not dissenting from denial of certiorari, but instead, Thomas complained about Tom, uh, Sullivan itself. Um, he argued that New York Times for Sullivan was basically made up it has no ground in the history of the Constitution. And even if the actual malice standard was appropriate for uh, government officials, it's certainly not appropriate for celebrities, right? People who are famous by virtue of show business or something else, right? And it's definitely not appropriate for people who thrust themselves into um, the limelight. Uh, now, Justice Thomas was the only one who wrote this opinion. Uh, he's usually very uh, uh, idiosyncratic, if I may. He's usually taking a position that no one else does. Look at his opinion today in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the video game case, right? He's always uh, 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 thinking on his own of things that people don't raise. And what Thomas said is, well, I'm not going to vote to take this case because no one asked us to overturn New York Times for Sullivan. Wink, wink, nod, nod. You should ask us to overturn New York Times for Sullivan. Uh, the, the upshot is pretty clear. Um, so now what, right? Uh, nothing happens. Um, there will probably be a case where some party will ask the Supreme Court to overturn New York Times versus Sullivan. Uh, it's an unpopular ruling. And in fact, in many European countries, it's a lot easier to sue for defamation, right? You don't need to show actual malice. You can just show there's a false statement. Uh, I think I mentioned this in class a week or two ago, but there was a British newspaper that wrote an article about Melania Trump with a lot of falsehoods in it. And they apologized quickly. And they published a full retraction. And I'm guessing they gave her a lot of money. Because under European and British defamation law, they could have been ruined as a newspaper. So, you know, the United States is somewhat unique. We have a First Amendment. Most countries don't have that. So I think there are a couple things for you to think about, right? First, uh, is the court likely going to overrule Sullivan? Um, probably not. Uh, there's maybe one, maybe two votes for that. I don't think there's much more than that. Uh, but second, 
uh, even if Sullivan makes sense for government officials, so that people have uh, space to criticize the government, doesn't make sense for celebrities. It right? doesn't make sense for people who um, became famous by virtue of their association with Bill Cosby, um, for example. Right? And, uh, you know, that's what Justice Thomas usually does. He usually flags an issue that people weren't really talking about. We were. Uh, but he flags an issue and then people start thinking about it. Okay, so I saw Jesse, I saw John, and, and JC. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm a little confused. Obviously, Bill Cosby is a public figure. Yeah. But the woman that made the accusation, you're saying that because the argument was made that because she was also now a public figure, the actual, actual malice applies. Well, no, no, no. She was suing. No, no. What happened was Bill Cosby sued her. He's a public figure, right? Right. Yeah. Figure. And they're saying that she also thrust herself into the public as well by virtue of making this sort of accusation. But what is that? Does that even matter? The actual malice standard would still apply? No, no, no. Okay, so, so let, let, me, let me say it again, Chloe, right? She said that Cosby engaged in sexual crimes against her, right? right. Okay, so she made a claim against Cosby. That claim turned out not to be true. Or maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but you couldn't prove it, okay? Cosby then sued her mm -hmm. for defamation, right? Just like Alabama. Yeah, just like Alabama, right? Cosby would then need to show, right? In, in order for that claim to succeed, he would show that she, that she defamed him with, with actual malice, mm -hmm. right? The fact of whether she was famous or not is not relevant to this case, right? right? But Cosby would have to show that she had actual malice there. Right. Got it? When you brought up, when you mentioned yeah, yeah. her, right? I, she wasn't like the New York Times. She was basically the likely victim of a crime, right? right? This wasn't like someone, uh, you know, the friends of Martin Luther King criticizing in the New York Times the, the police commissioner. This was a woman who had some stuff happen right. and who hadn't, like, uh, tried to make a. Uh, uh, a public criticism of government official. Make sense? Yeah. So okay. If, you, if you're a nobody and you go after a celebrity and it, as in the Me Too movement, then you're, you're thrusting yourself into the public domain well, and you have to do, do a different standard? Well, let, let's, just, let's, just, let's just consider the hypothetical, right? Um, generally, if you make a false statement about someone, right? Mm -hmm. And if that person is a um, celebrity or someone famous, to recover for defamation, they have to show that you who made the false statement had actual malice, yeah. right? But let's say, let's say you defame someone who's not famous, but by virtue of the defamatory statements, they become famous. Mm -hmm. This is a situation with the boys in Kentucky, the Covington boys, yeah. right? This teenage kid was no one. I mean, I mean I'm insulting, but like he, he wasn't anyone famous beforehand. But by virtue of what people were saying about him, he became, at least for a period of time, a fairly prominent figure, right? National news, visit the White House, everything else, right? So now what they're going to argue is reporters who made false statements about the, the, the kid from Kentucky, they'll, uh, uh, the, the Kentucky guy will have to show actual malice, that they actually... Had, should have reason to know those were false statements mm -hmm. because he was at least temporarily thrust into the limelight. Mm -hmm. uh, John and JC? So we have civilians and we have public figures. If they return, are we talking about carving out a new exception for specifically a class of people called celebrity? Well, I didn't assign this case, but it's in your book called Gertz, right? So right after we did Sullivan, there was a case called Gertz. And that was a case involving a, a not government official, but a person who achieved some notoriety. Um, celebrities uh, hate this rule, right? Bill Cosby sure hates this rule, right? Because for Cosby, he can't sue this woman for defamation because of the actual malice standard, right? If this were just a straight up normal defamation case, he probably would be able to sue her. And JC? My question was, in Europe, isn't the burden kind of flipped? What do you mean? For defamation? Like in, okay, here uh, as a plaintiff, you have to first prove that like the statement was false and caused you harm. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Europe, I believe the defendant, first of all, has to prove that the statement was false or true. Yeah. 
the defendant that is the, the person who's getting sued, right? Yeah, I think the burden split, like as far as the threat. Uh, you know, I'm not sure, but that sounds, that sounds plausible. Uh, but that's not the problem here, right? Cosby can prove that the statement perhaps isn't true, but what matters is he has to prove that her state of mind, that she knew it wasn't true, or she made it recklessly. That's the actual malice standard. That's the difference. But if something was false and you knew it was false, then you said it anyway. Right, but think back to Sullivan, right? They knew that Martin Luther King, or Martin Luther King was arrested, was it four times instead of six times, whatever the number is, right? It's not to show that they lied at the number of times he was arrested. They should have done it recklessly, that they should have uh, uh, known it was false, right? That, that they didn't uh, deliberately make the false statement. Like a, a simple uh, thing in terms of torts, like a negligent mistake, is not going to cut it. You have to really know that you're making this mistake. You seem a little perplexed. Prove it. Well, the thing with New York Times, that made sense to me because they weren't the people that actually wrote that article, right? Just, but the Times ran it, though, right? It, it wouldn't have mattered if the Times published it themselves as an editorial or, or whatever. It was, it was in their newspaper, right? So when you're running an ad, are you required to retain you know, an expensive fact checker? Uh, under American law, the answer is no. Under European law, the answer might be you should because if you fail to take all necessary precautions, you might be sued. It's also in the New York Times that um, their archives had the correct information, but even then, they weren't considered actual malice. You really, it, it, you have to, it, it, it's very hard to recover with the actual malice standard. John and then Cameron? Under the Cosby case, but she wasn't a public figure at the time that she made the claim. She became a public figure after, so would right. malice apply to her at all? Um, it's about Cosby, right? Okay, so he's the one she, yeah. she did it with yeah. malice? Again, it's a little difficult to conceive of, right? In, in the New York Times case, right, who criticized whom? The New York Times criticized the commissioner, right? Here, this woman criticized Cosby. He was the public figure. Okay, so she's not the public figure. That no, no, I mentioned that and it was somewhat immaterial. Uh, I'm sorry if I mentioned that to confuse. Right, but again, in the New York Times case, it was the newspaper commercial that criticized the, the, the police commissioner. Here, it's this woman who made a statement about Bill Cosby. And Cosby said this is defamatory. And so for uh, Cosby to sue her, right, they have to show that she made the statement with actual malice. And that's Cosby's burden. The plaintiff has a burden here. Unlike JC says that perhaps over in Europe, the defendant has a burden. Yeah. Okay, so I kind of confused along the same with JC here, but like with the Cosby as a situation, if she accuses him of something and makes that statement, mm -hmm. and he's able to prove, you know, beyond reasonable doubt that there's no way I did this, then she, when she made this, which in fact would have been proven a lie, would have known she was saying a lie. Mm -hmm. that, that, it sounds like that's malice. Like, well, I mean, you said he proves beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a high standard. Right. And uh, I don't know that he can ever get anything nearly that high. But for actual malice, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's that she, she knew or should have known that the statements were false, right? Um, here, maybe she had a mistaken belief. Maybe she had a different conception of what happened. You know, I don't know the specifics. But it was enough to meet the actual malice standard. I mean, it's always difficult, right? If you're a celebrity and you're accused of doing something wrong, by you then actually permit discovery into whether it in fact happened, right? There's always a risk of suing someone for defamation because you might open up the door if they find it actually happened. And that, that's always, you know, you're, you're taking a gamble. Evan? Yeah. Well, at what point did they become public figures? The second the tweet hit 1 million retweets, 2 million retweets? I mean, I'm being somewhat facetious, but when did they become a public figure such that the actual malice standard would kick in and criticism of them would require showing uh, uh, more than negligence? Uh, yeah, McKinney. That's an, and that was one of the things Thomas complained about in his dissent. Um, Thomas says, you have lots of people who, by virtue of chance, are thrust into the limelight. 
and they become national figures. And then when someone attacks their character and defames them, they then can't recover. So Thomas makes the exact point. There are there, there cases after Sullivan which discuss people who like, you know, imagine, I don't know, you witness an assassination, right? You witness an assassination, you're the only witness, right? And then you become a national figure. And then someone defames you. Okay, now you have actual malice. You didn't do anything to become a national figure, you just happened to be at the wrong place at the right time. But now, if someone defames you, it's harder to recover because of that one-time blip. Yeah. Security guard at the Atlanta Olympic Park where he was accused yeah. of being a bomber and then it turned out he wasn't, it had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember if that was an actual malice case, but it might have been. Yeah. So kind of jumping off of John's point, do, does the court look at the fact that you either voluntarily or involuntarily thrust yourself into the limelight, or do they look at the fact that regardless of how you got there, do you then make an intentional choice to benefit from the public forum? You don't have to benefit. It can be completely uh, non-volitional, right? You so what's can... the reasoning behind putting that standard behind someone who didn't do it voluntarily? Uh, those cases basically say public figures, uh, uh, it doesn't matter whether you did it voluntarily or not. I don't find those personally cases particularly persuasive, which I think is Thomas's point, right? I, I think we can all get on board with New York Times versus Sullivan. You know, you have a, a guy enforcing Jim Crow and he's suing the people fighting for civil rights for defamation. I think, I think more or less you can say, okay, that, that kind of makes sense. And then you say, well, you have a, a movie star, a celebrity. Well, that makes a little bit more sense, maybe a little bit less sense. Then you have a guy who just by virtue of being in the right place at the right time is now a public figure, can't defend his honor, right, his reputation, right? What, I think what Th Thomas didn't make this point explicitly, but I think what he's getting at is you're basically heaping fiction upon fiction, right? Maybe we can extract from the Alien and Sedition Acts Sullivan, but it's hard to go beyond that. But even then, even if we accept the Alien and Sedition Act history, that doesn't mean actual malice is the correct standard, right? Maybe it's something else. Um, generally, actual malice was a standard to recover punitive damages. That was where that standard came from. Uh, it, was a, it was a very high burden. And the courts are like, yep, just actual malice. We'll just use that standard for punitive damages. But, but you don't always need punitive damages because sometimes compensatory damages are adequate to, to make you whole. Um, so again, this is why Thomas does what he does. People seem, he always got this criticism that he was like Scalia's clone, he's whatever Scalia said. Independent, he thinks for himself. He has sometimes off-the-wall thoughts, but he makes his points, and we talk about them for 20 minutes in class. And you know, I was on I was on NPR last week, and I told the host, you know, Justice Thomas probably never listens to you, but he programs your show because he always has his opinions, and we have to come on and talk about it. And this is what Thomas does very well. Anyone else in Sullivan? Yeah, McKinney. Just one more. Um, did they ever define public figure? Um. Gertz, yeah, that was the case. It's in your book right after Sullivan. If you want to read it, it's there. Okay. Uh, but it's a very nebulous definition. And I'll, I'll add one point to your, to your question. Um, I don't know how social media uh, changes who is a public figure. Because, um, again, these boys in Kentucky, by virtue of these blue checkmark reporters, made these kids worldwide celebrities like in five, you know, a couple, a couple minutes. Right, maybe an hour, right? They didn't even know these kids. They were probably on a school bus home, right? Or flying home, they probably had no idea. But you can go from basically no one to a global celebrity in a matter of minutes if you get the right retweets. It's insane. So whatever, whatever the precedents are of someone who uh, avails himself or uh, involuntarily becomes famous, um, let me put it this way. If you are the victim of a Twitter mob, which they do exist, you are most by definition a public figure because people don't mob someone who's not important, but they become important by virtue of, this, of the public notoriety you get from the retweets. So it, it's going to be very hard for, I think, these, these, these kids in Kentucky to recover. I, I don't know if they're going to be able to. Yeah, Gabe and then Colby. So if you acquire the title Twitter, you apply the title what? If you get the title, like, Twitter, yeah. Yeah, how long does it last for? It's a good. It's it's a really good question, right? Like you said, like when nobody. I, I I think I think the the question is when was a defamatory statement made, right? How close in time, when you became a public figure, and when the defamatory statement was made, 
right? I think that's the relevant metric. Because if you are, you know, someone defames you five years later, or maybe, who, maybe I don't know, maybe once you're famous, you're always famous, right? You don't lose the followers, right? I, I, I don't know. Colby? Probably a stupid question, but like, if you get the, the blue check mark on Twitter. <laughs> I um, have one. <laughs> right, so whether you have it's not hard. 5,000 followers or 50 million followers, yeah. that check mark's there. You are considered a public figure. <laughs> Oh God! If you have a blue check mark, your public figure is that? Is that the new test? Well, that's, that's just like. <laughs> uh, oh Lord, help it's us! It's like when uh, when you talk about the social media. Yeah, there, yeah. One second, guys. One second. Yeah. People get these titles of public figures. You just one at a time, please. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there was, one second, guys. Yeah. There was, guys, just 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 one at a time, please. Thank you. Roxy, just one at a time. Okay, thanks. Uh, there go was ahead. like this scam out there that people could add the blue check mark to their Twitter account. Oh. And get all these random bot followers and stuff like that too. Yeah. So that thrust you into the public figure light. Oh my goodness! I, I'm I'm actually dreading um, a case from some court which looks the blue check mark as an indicia of public figure. Right? How many followers do you have? Oh my goodness! Um, I, I think John and then uh, oh sorry and uh, Andrew. Um, I was gonna say, well, the blue check mark doesn't make you like public. It just means you're verified as like this is that actual person. <laughs> so like basically can you be Google is what yeah. it really is but it does there is a correlation between amount of followers and activity yeah um, and that blue check yeah yeah John oh so you god were talking about how closely the Covington kids became public figures after the defamatory statement but it was the defamatory statement itself that made them a public chicken figure. egg yeah I think that's a good point right but there were lots of statements that sort of built up to them being public figures as well. It's not like there was just one report. There were no, thousands there of were reports. In the case that I read, I thought two things. Number one, these are minors, so I would give them extra protection. But number two, yeah. they were saying that, hey, the newspaper had more sources that they intentionally ignored yeah. to do something, and it was for profit. Yeah. It wasn't like it was just yeah. out of the goodness of their heart. Well, so I think they have a good well, case. Let me just make one last point more on this topic. It's nothing to do with um, First Amendment. It's an evidence question, right? Uh, when you have different sorts of evidence, you try and figure out what someone's state of mind is, right? What happens if your evidence is a text message and someone uses an emoji? I'm not joking. There are now court cases, there are now court cases where you look at various emoji and try to figure out what a person was trying to convey. And you know, intent can turn on which emoji you use, right? How are you using the poop, right? I mean, what's the, what, I'm not joking. There's this professor at Santa Clara and his specialty is on evidence law and emojis. He tracks all court opinions about emoticons. L Lord, Lord help us when judges have to use blue check marks on follower accounts to determine who's a public figure. My goodness. Just, just shut it down just at that point. Delete, delete your account and go off. Yeah, Gabe, last question, move on. Wait, what kind of emojis are we talking about? Dude, there are, there are a lot. <laughs> Look, sexual, there are sexual harassment cases that turn on the meaning of employee to employee Text messages. Don't say it. I knew you were going to say it. Don't say it. Oh, God. I'll no. 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 Stop. 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 Okay. Let's talk about crushing kitties instead. Oh, God. So, Stevens. Um, <laughs> a bad transition. <laughs> Emoji high heeled shoe. Okay. Let's, let's move on. Oh, God. Oh, God. OK. All right. Anyway, so the solving question is hard. I, I don't know what they're going to do with the, with the Covington case. I think that's going to be a, that's, that's going to be a very hard case. Yeah, Roxy, go ahead. Unrelated. Going back to last week. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Any question on last week, Roxy? Yeah. The Ashcroft case. Yeah. How is that different from like a police sting or online solicitation of a minor? Like, Never a child involved. It's right. Oh, okay. Let me. Let me. Actually, good. Very, let me. I'll use that question to bridge to this. Her question is: uh, You've all seen that show? Was it To Catch a Predator? Yeah. Right. Was it Chris Hansen? Right. That was, that's the host. Where he would basically, they basically would get a, a law enforcement officer to pose as an underage child, right? And they would offer me a female who kind of looks young, and they would talk to them on the phone, and in some cases even send them pictures to try and entice them to a physical meeting, and they show up at a physical location, and then the cameras pop out, they arrest them, Chris Hansen shows up, gives them, you know, and he puts them on TV to embarrass, you know, the hell out of them. And then so Roxy's question is like, you know, why is it a crime to basically 
pretend to solicit someone, pretend to be a minor, but not the picture. So I think here's the key point. Um, the photographs at issue in Ashcroft um, were by themselves uh, harmless. They were Photoshop. They were not real child pornography. Okay, But the speech at issue in the case Roxy mentioned is actually speech that's used as part of a crime itself. That is, the crime is separate from the possession of the photograph. What's the crime? Soliciting a minor, right? You're actually using your words, text messages, phone, whatever, to encourage someone to engage in a crime. Let me give another example, right? Let's say I tell you step by step how to synthesize meth, right? And I tell you exactly how to do it. You can probably charge me for conspiracy to uh, manufacture narcotics. I didn't actually mix the chemicals, but if I give you step by step, I'm saying, here's what you do, do this, do this, all right? If I give you step by step instructions of how to assassinate someone, right? You're going to find him at this location. This is when he leaves his house, right? There, get him right here. Shoot him at this spot, right? Again, I didn't actually pull the trigger, I didn't actually pick up a gun, but I can probably be charged with conspiracy to murder, right? Second degree murder or something like that. But wait a minute, Josh, aren't these just words, right? How can mere words give rise to any criminal liability? Can I just go to court and say, you're on a First Amendment of the right to speak of how to assassinate someone? Jess? The Anarchist Cookbook? Thank you. I know the book well. Isn't that similar, though? Because the book is giving you um, explanations of how to build XYZ. You know, whenever I present on 3D guns, people love asking me about that. So actually, let me, let me make that point. Um, if I publish a book on how to make meth, the step-by-step -step synthesizer, right? how to break bad, right? Um, <laughs> that book is protected speech. But if I give some of the instructions with the intent to actually make the meth, it's a different story, right? If I publish a book on how to be an assassin, that's protected speech, I think, at least. Um, if I give it to you, say, here's where you're going to find this guy, here's what you do, a little different story. If I put files on the internet that can be used to make a firearm, I think it's closer to the anarchist cookbook. Versus if I give some instructions of how to go and make a gun that's illegal, it's a different story. So a lot of it actually turns on the intent. But the bigger picture I want to describe is the mere fact that you're engaging in speech doesn't insulate you from any criminal liability. Right? A lot of it turns on the specific intent that you have. Right? Even think of the cross-burning case. Right? The, the, the RIV case said you couldn't burn the cross. But what if I burn someone's cross as a means to threaten them? Right? If I have the state of mind, the intent, the mens rea, to intimidate someone, that's a crime. So you're actually not prosecuting someone for the act of burning the cross. You're, at, you're, you're prosecuting them for the mens rea of having threatened someone. Okay, so Roxy, go back to your question. Um, when someone's charged for soliciting a minor, it's not that they're using the words, I would like to pick you up at such and such time. It's basically prosecuting them for having the intent of actually abusing a child. It's almost like an attempted crime, if you think about it, right? Okay, I'm with me. All right, so how, why, why, that's actually a very good segue to the, to the first case for today, which is Stevens. Um, I think we all agree, and my goodness, John definitely agrees, that this, the state can criminalize animal cruelty, right? There are no people involved, right? There's no human dignity involved, uh, but for a very long time as society, uh, we've had the protection of animals to varying degrees. Um, you know, animals can be slaughtered for food, um, but generally governments regulate how slaughtering occurs. Um, we've prevented sexual abuse of animals, so there's a lot of regulation. So we all agree that if the government wants, they can prohibit animal cruelty, which includes the sort of activity in this case, which is what are called crush films. 
Um, when this case first came out, one of the Supreme Court lawyers said, if you know what a crush mill is, you're a very deranged person. Um, I had never heard of this. Had anyone? Don't, don't raise your hand if you have. Uh, I, I, this was what, 2010. I, had nev I didn't know this was a thing. I, just, I, I never knew that this was even a thing that human beings would want to do. But they did. And Congress enacted a statute that criminalized the creation, sale, and possession of certain depictions of animal cruelty. And here's the key language. It says, in which a living animal is intentionally maimed, mutilated, tortured, wounded, or killed. Okay? If that conduct violates federal or state law, where the creation, sale, or possession takes place. So this hits it at each point in the supply chain. It's a crime to create it. It's a crime to sell it. And it's a crime to merely possess it. So this, this is the entire range, right? Whether you're the person filming it, you're the person selling it, or the person downloading it, or DVDs, buying it in the mail, whatever it is. Okay? All right, now let's start calling it people. I, I gave the facts. I think people start crying if they ask me to give the facts in this one. I've had it before. Yeah, Gabe, go ahead. Oh, good case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people may not have read that yet. Just remind us what that was. Uh, basically, it was a statute that sort of targeted um, like in a specific act of people killing animals. So. Yeah, the Santeria, right? The Santeria faith. We'll do this case later in the semester. Uh, this is a case called the Church of the Lakumi Bablu Aye. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a church, and part of their ritual is they do sacrifices of chickens, where they basically slaughter chickens, uh, and they... They cut their throat and they bleed out. It's a, it's you know, it's their, it's their thing. Um, and then the city said, "Oh, we're going to ban the slaughtering of animals um, because we have one hygiene, right? We want to have you know good sanitation." And it was pretty obvious they banned this slaughter because they wanted to punish this religion, so they couldn't do their ritual. And the Supreme Court unanimously said, "No, you can't do that." Um, but here, the reason why, or I'll call on someone. Who, who's next? I don't remember. Cameron, fine. Uh, Cameron, why did Congress enact this statute? Why isn't it enough to simply ban the crushing of these animals? Why do they have to also ban the, 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 the creation of the videos and the sale and the possession of the videos? Um, you just kind of really just kill the practice. Oh, poor choice of words. But, yeah, yeah, my goodness. It's very to crush the practice. No. Find the people who do this because they start running the videos. They do a good job of hiding who's making them or who's doing the actual crushing, so to speak. Yeah, yeah that's an important point, right? Um, one of the aspects of this genre of films is that the person doing the crushing is not on camera. It's generally just a shoe, and you don't know who's wearing it, right? Deranged people for sure, but it's very hard to prosecute the person actually doing the crushing because they're not on camera. And moreover, because of the internet, it becomes very hard to track down who actually made these films. And people make copies back when the VHS existed, but now they have DVDs, it's even, to make, even easier to make copies. So Congress made a judgment that we can't stop this form of animal abuse merely by banning the animal abuse. We have to go to the, um, the crux of the issue, right? We have to actually go to the source of it. Um, so Kyle, what case does this remind you of, this approach that we can't ban the activity, so let's ban the depiction? What does it remind you of? Yeah, do you remember the name? Bingo, yeah. So Kyle and Ferber, why did the court allow the uh, a crim the criminalization of her child pornography. What was the thinking there? Um, for two reasons. One is to stamp out the market, I guess, Good. Of it by itself. And then also, basically, like the filming in itself is the abuse of the yeah. child. Yeah, yeah, bingo, exactly. Right, so with child pornography, this is the Ferber case. The very act of creating the film. Right, the very act of creating the film was in itself exploitation of children, which was a crime. And Congress said, or the, I'm sorry, New York State said, we need to ban this 
to stamp out or eliminate the marketplace for these sorts of uh, movies. And I think Congress probably had a similar um, a similar goal in mind, right? The way to stop this form of animal abuse is by making it basically illegal to have the end product. And the, the facts show that most of the time these animals were tortured just for the purpose of filming it, right? It wasn't happening on like an independent basis. People were torturing these poor animals for the purpose of making these movies, these crush films, okay? But we all know the vote was eight to one, right? And actually it was, Alito concurred in, he kind of concurred, but not really, right? So we'll get to Alito in a bit, but it was basically an eight to one decision. Right, so Jessica, let's, let's do, um, walk me through the Roberts opinion. By the way, Roberts recently described himself as like the Supreme Court's biggest champion of the free speech. I don't quite know why, but he's given himself Snyder v. Phelps. He assigned himself Stevens. Uh, he, he's given himself, to, uh, the Chief Justice can generally assign himself the majority opinion, right? The way it works is the most senior judge in the majority gets to assign the opinion. And that's almost always the Chief Justice unless he's in dissent. Okay, so just gonna, walk me through the Roberts opinion, right? Why does, why does Roberts think that this federal law is unconstitutional? Um, he talks about like the exceptions and that <coughs> they agree with um, the government's reasoning um, for the new law didn't have the flaw and what it's intended to do. Mm -hmm. um, that you would, they would have to create, I guess, this particular, they would have to carve out a new exception for that. Okay, so, so Jessica, let, let's just walk through this, right? Robert says that there are certain categories of unprotected speech. What are these categories of unprotected speech that are, that are pretty familiar and well-known? Like Good. Uh, no, 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 not the last one. Not, not, not hate speech. That, that's not in there. Yeah, not in this class. Uh, yeah. What, what, what are the exceptions, though? Obscenity is one of them. Jesse, you got it? Good. Okay, very good. So the court goes through a list. They say this is a familiar list. So we have obscenity, which we did last week. That's Roth. We have defamation, right? Defamation with or without actual malice is prohibited. And it's almost an exception to the First Amendment. Uh, we'll do fraud, I think, in a week or two, right? If I lie to you and I say, uh, I'm going to sell you tickets to the fire Festival. These tickets are going to be awesome, right? <laughs> Yeah, job ja rule, who, I, I, I still don't get it. Um, the mere fact that I made this promise to you in words, spoken, doesn't mean it's protected speech, right? It's fraud. Um, another one, incitement to violence. I've mentioned this before. Uh, the standard from the days of just Holmes is no longer relevant, right? It's not enough that speech might have a tendency to lead to criminal activity. You have to incite imminent unlawful violence, right? That you have to stir someone to anger. It's, let's go burn this down now, right? This sort of very, very uh, 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 timely speech. Uh, this other category is a case I'm very familiar with, speech integral to criminal conduct. This is the sort of thing where you tell someone how to assassinate someone, right? Uh, you give them basically the guides of how to go ahead and break the law. Uh, notice on that list is not fighting words. Roberts didn't put fighting words there, which I, I noticed this Oh God, nine years ago it was decided, uh, but Roberts did not put fighting words in that list. So we generally have you know, a finite number, six or seven categories of unprotected speech. In this case, the Department of Justice, did Kagan argue this case? I can't remember. Uh, did Kagan argue it? I can't recall, let me check. Because this would have been her term that she was a Solicitor General. She was the SG for one term. Uh, no, a cocktail argued it. Uh, he, he was the deputy. Okay, so Kagan did not argue this one. Um, the government in this case, the Obama DOJ, wanted a new category of unprotected speech. They said you need to create a new category for animal cruelty crush films. Why? This speech is a very little social value, and the government will just ban it altogether. Uh, wait, does Roberts? Agree that new categories of speech be added here? <clears throat> a new category of unprotected speech be added? No. Okay, why not? Um, so he says that the government has a compelling interest here because this doesn't fall under one of the traditionally accepted categories. 
Oh, no, I know that, but they want to add, the government wants to add a new category, right? Why does Roberts not add a new category here? You're right, but what, why is Roberts not willing to add a new category of speech that's unprotected? So, I, from what I understood, it was because he just views this type of conduct uh, of owning this kind type of conduct, uh, this type of material, the way it's described is too broad. It can mm -hmm. be applied to anything, any type of like hunting or. Right. No, no, you're right, but but Colby, why does Robert not want to add a new category of unprotected speech? Um, then he, go, he goes on to say there's no evidence of a similar tradition. And yeah. The, and the government yeah. proposed test would broadly balance the yeah. value of speech against its societal cost. Yeah, yeah. So Robert says the reason why we have these other six categories, like defamation, obscenity, is there's a long-standing tradition of banning this sort of stuff. There's no similar tradition of banning depictions of animal cruelty. Right? Therefore, Robert says, we're not going to add a new category. And he rejects the notion that the First Amendment has a free-floating test of balancing. Justice Breyer loves balancing tests, but Robert's not a fan over here. He says, we're not going to simply balance the costs and benefits of free speech by adding a new category. Um, I think the government would argue that the idea of having a crush film was never a thing because people weren't that messed up in the past. Right? This is a fairly new way that people are messed up, uh, but the court wasn't willing to indulge that argument. OK. So the court says, we're not adding a new category. Therefore, we have a content-based restriction, and we apply our familiar strict scrutiny. And once the court applies strict scrutiny, you know the government's going to lose. Um, you know where it's going, but I think to Robert's opinion, it's still worth studying. So Dyer, let's talk about the exceptions clause. It makes an exception for uh, religious, political, scientific, educational, journalistic, historical, and artistic value. Dyer, why do you think the court added this exceptions clause to the, to the statute? They were trying to tailor it narrowly. Yes, exactly. This was an effort to more narrowly tailor the statute, saying, look, we're not going to try and punish religious depictions. So maybe you're a Santeria, you want to slice a chicken's neck, right? We're not going to go after you. Uh, maybe uh, you're a journalist and you want to broadcast um, a slaughterhouse that's abusing animals. We're not going to punish the, the reporter. Uh, maybe you're doing a, a documentary on Spanish bullfighting, right? We're not going to punish you. Uh, maybe you want to depict uh, uh, some form of animal cruelty in a, you know, in a scientific study to show how animals were abused. Okay, we're not going to punish you there. So what they're trying to do is narrow the scope as narrow, well, more narrow, to go after the animal cruelty. McKinney, does Robert seem to be persuaded about this, um, this exceptions clause? No. no. Why, why not? I mean, it kind of goes back to what Colby was saying that they don't they don't like this tradition of banning animal cruelty. It's too overly broad. The statute is too overly broad. Um, I think he kind of sees it. It's transparent that what, what, he, know, he knows yeah. that they're targeting these crush films. In my opinion. So the videos at issue in this case weren't even crush films. They were pit bull fighting videos, right? Mm -hmm. And if you remember with the Michael Vick thing some years ago, this was a huge scandal about maybe 10 years ago. Um, but Congress didn't just, this is actually, let me jump back to Alito for a minute because I think McKinney's point makes it well. Alito is like, why can't Congress just enact a statute that bans crush films and nothing else, right? Why do they have to make it broader to include all acts of animal cruelty? And indeed, indeed they did. Shortly after the decision in Stevens, Congress reenacted another version of this law that only bans crush films. So that's in the books now. I don't know if there are any prosecutions under it, but it's on the books now. But here, they, they have the phrase of animal cruelty. And a lot of the arguments, like a second dire, a lot of the arguments focus on hunting videos, right? Um, you know, I don't know what your opinion is on hunting. I've never been hunting. Uh, but I'm sure a lot of people say that that's a needless infliction of cruelty to shoot an animal with a bow and arrow or the rifle or whatever else. And there's a long tradition of publishing hunting magazines, right? And hunting videos and hunting tutorials of how to skin an animal, right? How to, how to clean it, how to do different things to it. 
And if you go to the Supreme Court saying that I want to ban a long-standing practice, you're probably going to lose. Dyer. Well, no, I, I just, I was kind of confused on there. They were just banning the possession and sale of, of the, the foreign, because uh, uh, in some of the, uh, here we're talking about the Spanish bullfights and, yeah. and the dogfights so in some cases were in Japan. Uh, well, the, the question is whether they're legal where the crime occurred, right? So if, if the bullfight was lawful in Spain, then uh, I don't know that would, be, that would trigger the provision of the statute. Well, this includes the, the sale and distribution. So if it was distributed to America, then it would. Yeah, that, that, that's actually my question. It's, it's like, I, I'm just well, I, don't, well, it's, I don't know if it still is, but I, I, I've traveled places where cockfighting is legal, and, and they, in fact, I actually had it on television. Uh, and you, is, is the possession of that video in the United States made it illegal? Okay, so it's a crime to possess it if, the, if that conduct violates federal or state law where the creation, sale, or possession takes place. So, okay, so yeah, if it's illegal to bullfight in, in, in Texas because the uh, act is, is criminal there, then yeah, you couldn't sell, yeah. Yeah, so then, let me just, so, yeah. So, so, so basically, yeah, so the foreign point, let me get Darius' point straight. Even if the bullfight was lawful in Spain, because bullfighting is illegal in Texas, you can't sell it in Texas because it's illegal to do the conduct there. So basically, it's a global ban, right? Anything that's illegal in the United States would then be legal to distribute a video of here. I think, I think, yeah, I think you read it the right way. Yeah, good point. So, yeah, the international. So, Roberts spent a lot of time talking about hunting videos. And also, I don't think, they didn't mention the foreign part there, did they? I don't think. They, they were talking about the Japanese. Oh, the Japanese, yeah, yeah, the Japanese one. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in Japan. Yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, interesting, we're talking about the Japanese stuff. So, even in 2010, there's kind of, a, I feel like, a strong regional bias on this. They talk about how they've had these. Japan pit fights in mm -hmm. parentheses, where such conduct is allegedly legal. I feel like if this was something that took place in France, they would have looked up whether it was legal or not. They talk about how the Spanish bull fights hmm. are legal. But here at Japan, they're like, I don't know why in the opinion you feel where they're allegedly legal. You send someone like 10 minutes to look that up. Let me ask you a question. Should judges be Googling stuff? Well, your clerks. Clerks, your clerks be Googling <laughs> stuff. Yeah, you know, I don't know why they, I never thought about that. It's a good point. Stick that in like, well, allegedly it's legal. It's just, it's like, I mean, it's possible it's an open question, right? Maybe, I mean, maybe Japan has some sort of uh, animal cruelty statute where some of a loophole or gray issue, right? Maybe if you have a license, you can do it. If not, I mean, they're, they're I don't know, it's a, good, it's a good point. I feel like if it was a European country, they would have, uh, we'll see if it's legal or not. Oh, you mean it'd be harder for the clerks to, to Google Japanese yeah, statutes? Yeah. I mean, that's a non-trivial concern, right? I mean, let, no, let's just take your point. If this was, you know, assuming the clerks speak a few different languages, would you be comfortable, like, going into Westlaw, Japan, and, and checking the status of animal cruelty laws there? Would you want to do that? Me? No, I wouldn't be. John, you do it. don't have to address it at all. They could just not talk about it. But I, feel like if they're going to but I think they had to because of Dyer's point, because they wanted to make the point this is very broad, that it criminalizes, like, just let's say you go on vacation to Spain and you film a bullfight, and then you bring your video camera home, your iPhone is now contraband, right? Because you're possessing a film that was legal where it was, but you're in a state where it's not. Andrew? I was just going to go with the, um, the point of how like, the exceptions really were just were so weak. Um, what was it goes that um, about determining whether a particular depiction falls within one of the uh, accepted categories is too tenuous to withstand. Yeah. Yeah. And another point the government says that, um, uh, uh, Nathan, at another point the government says that we'll only prosecute extreme acts of animal cruelty, right? Does that seem to persuade, <laughs> does that seem to persuade Roberts at all? No. Uh, Why not? He says merely that they, uh, he won't, he says he won't uh, uphold an otherwise unconstitutional law uh, simply because the, pro the government promises to yeah. accuse it. Yeah, yeah. In other words, we're not going to trust the government to say so, right? In other words, if the restriction is not in the statute itself, the court won't rely on the government's promise. Oh, we we'll only go after really bad cases, right? Extreme cases. Um, don't trust us. Okay. All right. Uh, so ultimately, the court declares the statute unconstitutional. And they say at the end, we do not decide 
Whether a statute limited to crush films or extreme animal cruelty depictions would be unconstitutional. And then wink, wink, nod, nod. Hey, Congress, you can enact the exact same statute with a few different words, and they did. And President Obama signed it to law, I think, a year or so later. Um, so this is all based on sloppy drafting, right? Had Congress drafted a more tight statute the first go-around, I think Mr. Stevens, I mean, the video they described the pitbulls was pretty god-awful. Uh, I think they probably would have been able to convict the guy. But um, I, I don't know if there have been any convictions. They wants to check since 2010. I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't heard of any. Certainly none that have made the circuit courts of appeals. But um, I, I can't. I don't know. Whatever the court says, we're not deciding this issue. It's saying, do this, right, here. here. Do, do, do this other thing that we, we said will be OK. I think they made the statute too broad. They said, well, we want to prohibit all depictions of animal cruelty if they had narrowed it to extreme or just the crush films, right? They descri they descri think of the obscenity test, right? It's not if say we are prohibiting obscenity. You have to describe the specific sexual acts that are that are prohibited, like you know masturbation, defecation, whatever the acts are. Here it's just animal cruelty. If they said we're making it a crime to depict an animal getting crushed with a high heel shoe. Well, yeah, but then they also say, but only for commercial gain. So what they're just trying to make it if they give it away for free, it's okay. Um, the intent was to stop it altogether. It's like that's a big giant loophole. I didn't charge it. I just gave it to. Him. Well, I'm sorry, just one at a time. Raise your hand, whoever wants to say something. Yeah, yeah, Kyle. Oh, I love that answer. I wish. Um, yeah, Congress can generally regulate whatever the hell it wants because uh, it's necessary and proper to help people out um, or something like that. But, uh, but this isn't wheat. This is animal food. Uh, it, it's true, but I mean, quite literally, if you're selling a commercial product in the interstate marketplace, I think they can generally get, get, get them on that. Mm -hmm. Someone else had her hand up, I think. Yeah, yeah, Dyer. So you're saying it, when they're limited to extreme, are they going to have to define extreme? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that goes to almost a, a, a jury instruction issue, right? How do you, can you imagine being in a jury for this case? I think jury, just think of jury selection for a minute in this case. Does anyone have a pet? Yeah, disqualify everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Right. Excuse. Go home. I think I'd take a bench trial on this one. This, this would be a hard, hard case. But yeah, what's extreme? Which is why I think what, what Robert is saying is you have to define the act of crushing the, the animals in a very precise fashion. So that way there's no vagueness or ambiguity about what the conduct is that's prohibited. Yeah, John. Doesn't this fall under the obscenity of a, like an objective person who just looks at this and say that's OK, a this is an important point, right? Um, uh, 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 Noel, does obscenity apply, or what, what kind of conduct does obscenity apply to? Oh, John's next, perfect, yeah. Um, what is it, specific sexual conduct? Sexual, not violence. It applies to sexual conduct. But John, this question is, oh God, isn't this stuff for sexual gratification though? The intent of the crushing, as I understand it from yeah. what I read, yeah. is. Yeah. So I think it falls But out. the conduct itself is not. It doesn't involve genitalia. That could be animal, but it doesn't involve human genitalia interaction, et cetera. Or fecal matter. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It is made for sexual gratification. Right. So here's the key point. Obscenity. Yeah, I mean, people get off on everything, right? But <laughs> obscenity has to involve genitalia and, and people and engaging in sexual acts. But stuff used for people to get sexual gratification is not obscene. This came up, look, this came up in, in the next case, right? Breyer says, how is it possible that actually a woman getting bound up and gagged is sexual, but a video game representation of it is not, right? Doesn't that go back to that objective, subjective standard? Where we're reasonably it's computerized. Versus... It's computerized because of the Ashcroft case. It's not real. It's depicting violence in a video game. But they take that same standard and test and apply it to this is extreme. If an objective person would look at this and say, yeah, that's extreme, that's extreme. Again, I, if anyone wants to just Google this and check if there have been any prosecutions for crush films since 2010, you know, just raise your hand. I, don't, I, I would want to see what the jury instructions look like in that case. I don't know. I think those would be hard. My god, yeah, just. 
of the new one, like the new code that they have, they have a fresh yeah. law. And it does say um, the two elements of defining what the Animal Crush video is. The second one is that it has to be obscene. Oh, I'm sure it says that. I don't know that that, that works. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah, I, 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 I. It also talks about foreign commerce and interstate when it talks about distribution. Uh, have, it, does it list any prosecutions that you've seen under it? Uh, not. There was one here in Houston, I think, in 2016. Oh boy, and they got they got conviction. Um, it's Katie, was it? Oh shh. If you just want to send me that link, I'll take a look at it later. Sure. Thank you. Right, but this statute, I want to do Alito's opinion. Um, yeah, Ryan, so walk me through Justice Alito. Again, he, he, he dissents, but he's not, he doesn't like this statute as is, right? Okay. But, but, but Ryan, Ryan what, what, what are the grounds he's dissenting on? Well, he just thought that the court should have, uh, in lieu of the evidence that was presented, kind of construe the language of the statute more like narrowly itself. Yeah. Um, so going to the whole discussion about hunting and all of that, and it compared it to Ferber. Yes. He says this is Ferber. If you can ban child pornography as a means to stamp out child exploitation, then you should be able to ban crush films to stamp out animal abuse. Now, Kelly, why does the Ferber analogy, why does the majority not accept Ferber, right? Why does the majority think Ferber does control this case? It's, a little, doesn't, it's not explicit, but you know, what, what, what do you think? Um, let's see, Ferber has three prongs, or? Do you think of Miller? Mm -hmm. Ferber was a New York case involving child mm -hmm. pornography. What does the what does the majority say about child pornography? John? It was on 1477 at the bottom when they compared and said there was like a de minimis reason they were related and then they said but this isn't that. Yeah, they basically say child pornography is different and unique. Right? They basically say that it's such a terrible, unique thing that we can't compare it to anything else. Um, they don't really distinguish in any meaningful sense. They sort of say it's, it's different. Yeah, John. So we talking before class. Why did Kennedy, or sorry, Roberts fight so hard to save Obamacare but didn't fight oh, so hard Oh, God. Oh, you hey, don't. I don't. <laughs> it seems did. like he pulled every trick out of the he hat to make that chooses. go. He picks and chooses. But um, this, I, I find myself siding with Alito and thinking, well, this is just him doing Phelps. Like, wake up. Well, I mean, look, look at Alito. I mean, if Roberts describes himself as the most pro-free speech justice, Alito dissented in Phelps? Alito dissented in Stevens, right? Uh, Alito dissented in, oh, he wrote a basic concurring opinion in the Schwarzenegger case. Um, he's probably the least protective justice speech we have right now, I think. Yeah, Andrew? I was gonna say with Alito, I do like Alito's opinion, but I feel like there's more arguments. The government made a lot of really bad arguments. They did. That the majority had to just say no. Like, I, the idea that, like, the exception with the hunting and how we address that, I'm like, I think that hunting videos, like, you go to Outdoor Channel, I mean, you see hunting shows all day long, and it's like, you could, that's easily, I can easily conceive that as journalistic. Yeah, so I mean. You're documenting what you're yeah. doing. I mean, it's, so Alito would almost give it like a saving construction. This, I think this is John's point, right? We would read the statute narrowly to only apply to crush films. In which case, Mr. Stevens would not be convicted because he didn't have a crush film. He only had animal uh, pit, pit fighting. JC, was your hand up? Or someone over here? Uh, it was me. I was just going to say well, that and obviously one's legal and one's illegal. So I'm not sure. But yeah, the, they're both illegal. Animal cruelty and, and child exploitation are both no, crime. I'm saying the animal cruelty and the hunting. Yes. Yeah, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, the, the hunting is legal in, mo in most states. Yeah, exactly. So, um, that distinction to me is very easy to make, and that's why I was kind of looking at this like, I don't know why we went down this rabbit hole. Right, but the, the conduct has to be legal in your state. Now, but how that works, I mean, hunting is it during buck season, you have a license. I mean, it's it's license, it's regulated. Yeah. It's crush videos, it's free flow. Just do it. Oh, yeah. Well, yes. even, well, I was going to say, even with hunting, not all hunting is regulated. So, like in Texas, you can hunt hog all. All day long. All they want you long. to kill it. Get as many as you want, and there's no nutrients. The, 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 the state would, would thank you for doing that much effort into it. Like, 
like that. But yeah, you still need a license. I mean, yeah, certain yeah. areas you can't do it in, too. Well, like, yeah, the city, but, like... Yeah. Wimps. All right. <laughs> Uh, any other questions on the Alito? I think he makes a fair point. And uh, Alito always does it. I think he writes a dissenting opinion because he doesn't want the record to go quiet. Right? I think he dissented in Snyder v. Phelps and he dissented here. Uh, to not, so people recognize that it's not a unanimous issue, that there, is, there are different views. But as a general matter, he, he views free speech fairly narrowly, especially when we get to Matalvi Tam. We'll discuss Alito versus Kennedy. Um, or, you know, the, okay. <coughs> Anyone else on Stevens? It wasn't too bad. Okay. What's the next case? Uh, Brown versus EMA. Uh, so, I mean, we had um, Stevens, Brown, and, Sn uh, I'm sorry, Snyder, uh, uh, Stevens, and Brown, like, decided, like, within two, two or three years of each other. They all decided, like, back to back. I think it was, I think it was Snyder v. Phelps in 2010, Stevens in 2010, and then Brown in 2011. They're all within maybe two years of each other. So we had a lot of free speech cases, right, in a fairly short period. All right. Uh, so anyone here like playing violent? I didn't have to finish the damn question. <laughs> wow, a lot of you. My, was that? The Zelda. Yeah, well then, yeah. My, I, I have very bad hand-eye coordination, so I'm terrible at video games. I just, I can't, I, I can't do it. It's not my, I don't, I was not born with that talent. So I, I don't get the violent video games. But um, when this case was being argued, um, it was a huge case because the entire comic book lobby, the video game industry lobby, the movie lobby came out uh, uh, in support of, of this California law. Now, just, just two fun facts. Uh, when the case was, was that? Oh, I, I love that one. I added that to the book. I made. Yeah, so the, the sponsor. The sponsor of this bill was a guy named Leland Yi, who was this uh, was from San Francisco or somewhere in California, and he was the one who was like, "We have to save the kids." And this guy got busted based on what was it conspiring with foreign governments to run guns and stuff? It was like this yeah, insane, like rock and stuff. No, yeah, no, like heavy munitions. Yeah, <laughs> he was trying to regulate the militia, I suppose, right? And the other fun part was the case was originally called Schwarzenegger versus EMA, and then Arnold. This term finished, and then we had Governor Jerry Brown. So that's why it's boring Brown. Uh, but I think it would be a lot more memorable if it was Schwarzenegger versus Ian Can you imagine Arnold, right, going to the Supreme Court, <laughs> arguing <laughs> that we need to reduce violence in the media. It, yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, we need to terminate violence. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so, JC, you want to walk us through the facts, please, sir? Okay. So, video game thing in California. Uh, California apparently thought that young or children younger than 18. 17? 18. 18. 18. Anyway, so younger than 18 shouldn't be allowed to buy these video games without their parents' permission. Uh huh. Uh, Scalia's opinion basically says the same old thing. Uh, you can't shelter the children. They read graphic novels. And this is well, just, just walk me through the law itself. Just, just walk me through the mechanics of the, of, the, of the California law before we get to Scalia. So how, how does the law operate? I'm assuming if you're under 18, then you can't buy the video game that's being too graphic. Who, who can buy it, though? The children? The, not the children. The parents. I thought the parents, parents could buy it. The, the parents could. Who, right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, you, just, you inverted it. I knew what you meant, right? Oh. So when you walk into any video game store now, and you see, you know, rated M for mature, um, that's a voluntary system, right? Most people don't know that. They think the government mandates it. It's completely voluntary. When you go to the movie theater and you see rated R or whatever it is, again, that's voluntary. So movie theaters, retailers, they comply with this law so that they don't get in trouble, right? It makes sense. The reason why they had it was to prevent Congress from mandating a rating system. But California said this is not enough. We need to not only have these rating systems on the cartridges or the games, whatever else, but we need to actually make it a crime for the retailers to sell it to underage individuals. Now, if a parent wants to buy these video games, these violent games for their kids, you know, that's their choice, right? We'll ban that later. But, oh, whoops. Uh, but, we're not going to let these kids walk into a Walmart by themselves and buy this, this game. Okay, so Alicia, 
How does this California law separate permissible games from games that are subject to this, this restriction? What, what has it defined the bad stuff? What games are under or are going to be under this, this restriction? The yeah, has it defined violent? Let's, what standards does the, does the statute use? It, it, it defines towards the beginning what, what exactly is prohibited. Oh, I'm sorry. Killing, maiming, dismembering, sexually assaulting an image of a human being. <clears throat> yeah, keep reading, please. Um, in a manner that a reasonable person considering the game as a whole would find appeals to a deviant or morbid interest to, of minors, that is patently offensive to prevailing standards in the community as to what is suitable for minors. And that causes the game as a whole to lack serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value for minors. Okay, so what does this statute resemble? It, it, it resembles something we've studied recently. Um, Carl? Go ahead. Pornography. Not, not pornography. Pornography. Yeah, yeah, Miller. Yeah. This is it, it's basically Miller with a twist. Right, because you notice they just shoved the word minor in every single element, right? Um, but it's different in one regard, right? Carl, what was the Miller test originally applied to? What sort of conduct? Um, obscenity. Um, but what, what, what was obscene? What, what Was violence obscene? No, it was a, uh, the acts, the sexual acts. Sexual acts, right. The obscenity test, Miller, only applies to sexual conduct. It doesn't apply to graphic depictions of violence. What they did was they basically tweaked the Miller test. Right? They said killing, maiming, dismembering, sexually assaulting, if those are acts are depicted in a way to appeal to the deviant or morbid interest of minors. Remember the word was prurient. That's our favorite word, right? Whatever the hell that means. It means something about sex. Right. But instead of prurient, it now is deviant or morbid. Morbid meaning death, I guess. And the second one is patently offensive to the community as to what is suitable for minors. Again, it's adding children to the mix. And it lacks literary value for minors. So they try to track the statute from the, uh, uh, the Miller test. But they also have to deal with Ashcroft. Right? We did Ashcroft last week. Ashcroft said you can't ban depictions of child pornography that are simulated. So how does a statute have any chance after Ashcroft? I, 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 didn't, I was pretty sure they would lose, but this is a hard statute to, 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 to defend after the Ashcroft case. Right? Anyway. All right, but let's walk through the analysis. All right, so Roxy. Does California dispute that the video games are protected by the First Amendment? No. Should they have? Is that an easy case what, that a video game is, is speech? Why code, right? Is code speech? Why, what, what, why, why is that such an easy point? The court spends like one sentence on it. Uh, it says we've long recognized that it is difficult to distinguish politics from entertainment and dangerous to Yeah, so this is pretty broad, isn't it? Right, when I argue the 3D printed gun case and the judge made a comment about, you know, why is this speech? I said, Judge, this is the Supreme Court. Basically everything everything's speech. And and it's you know logically, we can say there's a difference between a book and a video game. I think Scalia acknowledges that. But the court doesn't want to draw a line in any meaningful sense between the two mediums. Okay. So Scalia then makes another couple important points. Um, for whatever Scalia's uh, conservatism was, he was always very big on free speech. And you know, Texas versus Johnson in the video game violence case, Scalia had a, a soft spot for free speech. Um, he never dissented on the Sullivan case. You know, he's passed away now, but I don't think he would join the Thomas dissent were he here. Scalia writes that basic principles of free speech do not vary with new and different communications of mediums. The most basic principle 
is that government lacks the power to restrict expressions because of their content. The court had recently decided Stevens, and they said we're not going to add a new category for crush films, and we're not going to add a new category for video games that are violent. He then says, speech about violence is not obscene. This is not like obscenity for minors. So whatever Ferber or Miller may have provided is irrelevant for violent video games. I read this case. It made it from the Fifth Circuit, actually, one in Houston. Oh, thank you, yeah. And um, so basically, he was, he was convicted on three counts of violating Section 48, right? Uh-huh. The, the, new, the new statute, right? The one that yeah. they reenacted. And that one requires two elements. Uh -huh. It requires um, that it has to be sexual, right? And it has to be patently offensive or whatever. Uh-huh. So they actually overturned one of his counts. Really? He convicted on three counts because one of the nasty videos he made was not sexual. The other two were. Oh, so about bestiality, basically. Uh, yeah, you could say that. Oh, so they, they got him in basically obscenity with bestiality. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So everyone understand what Kyle just said. He found a Fifth Circuit case involving um, the new version of the Crush statute. And because it was obscenity was bestiality, which involves basically sex with an animal, that was permissible. But where there was no sex with the animal, they overturned the conviction? Yes. Charming. Okay. Who, just, who wrote that majority opinion, the panel opinion? Actually. Yeah, I bet it was. <laughs> no one wants to put their name to that one, I guess. Um, who, who was the panel? Reevely, Southwick, and Haynes. Oh, I know them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think, I don't, I don't think Southwick wanted his name on that one. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that uh, interlude. Um, okay, going back. Scalia says that Stevens controls this case, right? You can't define a crush film like obscenity, and you can't define violence like obscenity. Okay? They also say this case is not like Ginsburg. Now, this is not like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, this is Ginsburg with an E. Uh, by the way, never spell her name with an E. People do it all the time. It drives me bonkers. It's U-R-G. Okay? Uh, who's next? Jesse. So why is this case different from Ginsburg? Right, Ginsburg was a case from, I think, the 60s, an old case. Yeah, it involved girly magazines, it, it, you know, <laughs> for the Internet, where New York, it was New York, yeah, it was New York made it a crime to sell girly magazines to minors. Uh, this is a thing people today will never know, but when you were, when we were younger, if you want to buy a Playboy magazine, which doesn't really even exist anymore, you need someone to have it give you a fake ID, right? In, at least in New York. That's what you would need to have done. Um, so, Jesse, why can the state ban selling girly magazines to kids, but they can't ban selling video games to kids? So, like you said, it's going for the Yes. For speech directed at children. Okay, so Jesse, let me just, just ask one more question. Is material that's obscene for children the same as material obscene for adults? <laughs> you think there's a difference, or they're the same? Yes. Well, well, no, no. I'm sorry. It, <laughs> is there a difference? Yes. There is. Okay, good. Thank you. You're right. Uh, the yes and no tripped me up for a minute, right? The court says that the obscenity standard could be lower for kids. Right, that's not implicit in Miller, but they say it can be. So what might be obscene for a minor is not obscene for an adult. But again, they say it's about sexual activity. Violence cannot be used for the obscenity. And I think that follows from the Ashcroft case fairly logically. I think California was, you know, they, they pass lots of laws that sometimes get upheld, sometimes don't. But I think they, 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 they probably shouldn't have upheld one. Oh, funny story. So... The Ninth Circuit, which is the federal court in California, had this weird tradition where if a judge died before a case was decided, they would still count his vote if he cast his vote before his death. In other words, judge is alive today, he says, I'm going to vote for party X, and then he dies tomorrow, and the opinion comes out in a month. The Ninth Circuit had a policy where they would still count the dead judge's vote. So even beyond the grave, judges can cast vote. So today, in an opinion of the Supreme Court, a little, little bit snarky, 
uh, a reverse that decision, saying that a judges of life tenure they don't they don't serve for eternity, mm -hmm. um, and they reverse the, uh, the, the 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 vote cast by the dearly departed. Very bizarre practice. Okay, but the ninth, but the California thought this law will be fine. Okay. Now, uh, Ruth, let me ask you this question. There's a little bit of a dispute between Alito and Scalia. And again, I think they, they have a very serious disagreement here. It is by dictionaries, yeah. <laughs> you liked that one, didn't you? Right. So, Ruth, let me ask this question. Scalia says, no, Alito says that the video games are something new, right? They're different than the books. They're different than movies. Scalia says, no, they're not really new. It's the same thing. Right? What's, describe this disagreement for me. What, how does Scalia respond to Alita's argument that these things are not really new? Um, well, he goes to there being violence in like, fairy tales. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. My friends who actually play violent video games, what do you, is, this, is this accurate? What? That, that, that there's, that, that, that violent books and violent video games are, you know, should be treated the same way. Uh, I'm at, okay. I mean, I've read, they even say it in the case, I've read Lord of the Flies. Yeah. That's probably one of the most violent things I've ever encountered. Yeah. And that was read in school. They yeah. can do Lord of the Flies too with more blood and new fatalities. They would like improve on that. Yeah. So we can make it nastier. And reading, reading is pretty. Okay, good. just raise your hands. Okay, McKinney and Nathan, what do you think? Your 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 video is it a gaming laptop? Uh, quote unquote gaming laptop. Yes. Yeah. Is it that? It's terrible. I hate this thing. Look. So. Look. <laughs> it, what I think they gloss over is that the games that they're kind of talking about, like Mortal Kombat with fatalities and whatnot. Those are outliers. Most of the games have like really complex and deep stories. And actually, mm. the games he's holding up in the picture. Uh, Was he holding up? Assassin's, Assassin's Creed, Creed, Red Dead Redemption, and Grand Theft Auto. Those all have really complex stories that I think do have like value on par with classic literature, such as Lord of the Flies. So, I mean, is it the same kind of? Well, what about the, the the interactive element? That it's not just you're flipping pages. You're actually you know pressing buttons, which results in people getting a like, gagged and tied up. See, that doesn't happen. I've never played a game where you just like gag people and score points for killing people. I play a lot of games that it doesn't happen. The read your own adventure books. Yeah. I remember those. Yeah, yeah. Nathan, do you want to have something? Yeah. I mean, people keep comparing though to, you know, it, it's more violent and video game sort of thing. But, you know, we keep naming books like Lord of the Flies. Well, if you name a book that's written today, it's going to be a lot more violent than a classic literary book that you read back then as well. So I think not only is, I don't think it's fair to say that a book written back then, it's yeah. less violent merely, merely because it's a book. Yeah, Alec and then, then Cameron. Um, yeah, I was going to say two things. Well, one, you know, growing up playing video games like that, most of the video games you have have altered settings. You can restrict it and you do it and it restricts blood, gore, language, and things like of that nature or whatever. But I, mean, I remember reading like, Edgar Allan Poe when I was younger and being extremely frightened. Like, you know, I mean, gory, gory parts of those books and stuff. And yeah, like, when, if I remember, when Mortal Kombat first came out of the Sega Genesis, yeah. it had like a, um, uh, like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a, it was a neutered mode, right? But we put a certain code into it, it would unlock everything. So even back then, people were hacking it. Uh, yeah, Cameron. I mean, what's his name, Rick? Catcher in the Rye went, like, Salinger? I need to go kill oh. John Lennon. Are we going to, yeah. like, all of a sudden, the books? Like, you get rid of those? Like, uh, who, okay, so who disagrees? I want someone with the other perspective, right? Maybe it was a mom or a dad. Kyle? Not a mom or a dad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go for it. But, uh, yeah, so I played Grand Theft Auto before. <laughs> I think three, maybe, something like that. And the, the plot is complex, right? There are lots of ins and outs of it, but... <sighs> Base, like the basic gameplay is you can just go up to anyone with a bat and just like start beating them, right? And take their cash. You cannot do that? That's not the basic. Concept. No, no, I'm saying like <laughs> when you're not involved in a mission <laughs> or whatever else, like you can just drive around and Well, well, there was a game mentioned, guys, just one at a time. There was a game mentioned in the, in, the, in the book where you basically, you're in the book repository in Dallas and you're shooting at JFK. 
or you're shooting up Columbine, right? Mm -hmm. Th there are these games. Uh, Carl? Yeah, I, I'm a father. I have a seven-year-old, and uh, I don't, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't, we don't have these games in our house. We don't, I mean, he may not be at the age where he's entertained that thought, but I mean, I don't have him doing violent things because I find there's more productive ways to spend your time than that. Well, that, that's a different issue, but, but again, would you be comfortable with a law that says your kid can't buy unless you walk into the store with him? In other words, he can't go across the street and buy it himself. You have to walk in the store with him and buy it for her. I'll be okay with that. Yeah. All right, Andrew. I would say just as like a, you know, obviously I don't think there's a real difference, but to play devil's advocate, I would definitely say that video games um, make it, Visually, like you can actually, see, you don't have to use your own imagination to imagine what the, it's happening in the video games. I mean, I've 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 said I've I've read Lord of the Flies when I was younger, and I've read it recently, and I've imagined them differently because of my exposure and what I can see. I mean, the video games you're seeing it. that's what they're exposing mm -hmm. you to. But I think to say to play devil's advocate, there is that difference in them, a fundamental difference in them. Okay. Yeah. Wit Colby. What would you, I guess, Mike, in response to that, uh, and kind of some of the ideas about, you know, gun damage being more violent, hmm. but where you have books that describe, you know, an ex a stabbing against someone or some, you know, gruesome murders or Jack the Ripper, and is that worse or better than just seeing it take place quickly in a scene in a video game and then it moves on? You know, it doesn't really go into detail, but you see someone get stabbed, yet, you know, what images does it bring up in the child's mind when they read it on paper? Colby? So, when you said, does it make a difference between, like, when you asked him walking in with your child at 18 to buy something, like, uh, buy a video game versus being 18 to buy tobacco or something of that nature, to my knowledge, there's no studies or anything of that nature that show that these video games actually cause harm. Cause, right? I want to just pause on this for a moment, right? This is Breyer's dissent and Roberts replies to it. So California has experts. They say that there's a correlation between playing video games and violence. Now, you may have taken statistics in, in college or whatever, but there's a big difference between correlation and causation, right? The mere fact that more kids who play video games have violent tendencies doesn't mean that video games cause the violent tendencies. But the question is this, what level of proof do we hold the government to when they enact a statute? Do we have to demand a statistical survey to show there's actually causation? Or can they act on guesswork? Like Lito says, that this is new. We don't know in 20 years what's going to happen to these kids. Maybe they'll all be messed up, right? Why can't the government act prophylactically, right? They act in advance to prevent bad things. Maybe we're sure, maybe we're not, right? Why do they have to demand causation? Because if they demand causation on like this, if they go ahead and proactively prevent this from happening, you're abridging speech. Ah, and that, that's the key point. Without knowing what the actual harm is. And that's the key difference between Breyer and Scalia. Scalia says we have strict scrutiny, we demand exact proof. Breyer says I wouldn't apply strict scrutiny, I will give the state some deference on this law. Right? What if a causation study requires a 20 year longitudinal study? Okay, in 20 years we lost a generation of kids. Breyer says, why stop California from acting now when they may be able to prevent violent tendencies in the future? Because if you act now and you prevent something from happening, if it doesn't cause any harm, what, and you're acting before you know what harm can be caused, what's going to stop states from acting in the front when they think harm could actually take place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, John, and maybe one or two other people had their hands up? I guess my question is, with this law, why didn't you even come down to the first minute? Because my thoughts are... Most kids don't have 50 or 60 bucks to go unless their parents gave it to them. And they probably, unless Uber was around back then, the parents probably took them there anyways. Isn't money speech anyways? So if the parent gives the money to the kid and said it's at your discretion and they bought them the system, isn't that enough? Well, who is the plaintiff here? Was it mom and dad, Jimmy no, and Sally? Is who is the plaintiff? No, who is the plaintiff here? Well, the the video game, in no, 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 the government's oh. defendant. The video game industry is a plaintiff, right? Yeah, against this law. They were complaining that it's going to be hard to sell their games because of this regime. But what if they come back with commercial speech and say, hey, you're actually targeting kids with this violence? We'll do commercial speech next week. That, that's not completely relevant. But this was a case about the manufacturers of the games. 
they're basically asserting the rights on behalf of the children, which is sort of a weird deal, right? How can the video game lobby assert rights of kids? Cameron? Oh, well, one thing I was, you know, they kept bringing up like yeah. Yeah. Columbine video games. Yeah. I think there's bigger concerns if there's a kid looking at one to do their Columbine than the actual video games. But you stop it from happening by denying him that image in the first place. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dyer and then Alec then. Sorry, back to the causation. If we, if we prove that there's a, a, a causation from, don't we then have a problem with the overbroad because we've allowed kids whose parents approve as opposed to? Uh, I'm gonna get there in a minute, right? So this is the idea of under inclusiveness and over inclusiveness, right? This is a very common mode of argumentation which the court discusses but doesn't really explain. Over inclusive and under inclusive. So let's just start one at a time, right? This law is probably going to make it a crime to sell a lot of video games which aren't actually that violent because it uses standards that are pretty vague. So we say the law is over-inclusive, right? It's over-broad. It sweeps in a lot of stuff that should be protected. But it's also under-inclusive. If these video games are so damn violent, they should be banned altogether. Ban them. If these are so bad for kids, why should we even let children have them with parents' consent, right? If your mom goes to the store and buys you a pack of cigarettes when you're 15, that doesn't work, right? If your mom goes to the store and buys you a beer when you're 12, your mom can be charged with a crime, right? No? No? I think. Really? Parents can buy you liquor, not where I'm from. Okay. God, God oh my God, in Pennsylvania, if you're at a bar with your parents, they actually, they actually like watch you like a hawk. They actually don't give you a sip. It's fascist. In Pennsylvania? Yeah, I know. It, it's insane. They're really strict about it. Not in the bar area. No, you, they, they, they should go over there. Now we have, I was going to say, bartender in Texas. You have a six-month-old baby sitting at that bar right there. <laughs> okay, whatever. Okay, bear with me, right? If this stuff is so bad, then you shouldn't allow anyone to buy it. So there are over-inclusiveness problems and under-inclusive, right? The statute doesn't ban enough stuff. So the court's saying that this stuff really can't be that bad if you're letting people buy it with parental consent. Okay, but I think that's your question, Dyer. A couple other people, I want to get back to the case. Alec? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> my, my comment was that, I mean, the first time I ever played Mortal Kombat wasn't, I didn't own it. It was, I would walk to a friend's house, and he owned it, and I played it there. And so it's like, the, the kids will find a way. Of course they will. Of course they will. Most statues won't. Yeah, of course they will. The position, yeah, like, course they will. You know, no, this statue's idiotic. It's not going to keep games out. You download. I mean, most kids figure out like BitTorrent when they're like seven to how to download games. This is not going to do a damn thing. <laughs> Who actually buys games? I mean, I, Brittany. But on that note, then like Lady Bird's case was going to stupid to find a way to get the movie bags. Well, before the internet, that was harder. But yes, yes, you've, you've, there, are, there are ways to, to get around it. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, McKinney. Okay. Going off of that. <laughs> Yeah, um, close enough. <laughs> the, the Columbine game, the game where you're shooting the those games, like you can't even buy those in stores. Those are <laughs> online only. You have to go. You have to buy them from a uh, online retailer. I was thinking the market dictates that some games will be worse than others. Th those that are so fringe will just be online only. Yeah, there, there was like a big controversy when there was like this game on Steam where you're an active shooter. I remember that. Remember that they didn't sell it in stores. It was online only. Regulation didn't get there. All right. All right, Kyle, and then we'll move on to the case. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I have several things, all right? First of all, I agree with Justice Alito, because the, it, this statute is over-inclusive. Like, the sort of violence that I would be okay with censoring is like that, like reenacting an actual crime or he's sort of like tying up women and raping them and stuff like that, you know, like that sort of thing is just grotesque in my opinion, and you definitely can, if there's a sale, like you're putting in your credit card information, that's commercial activity, you can certainly regulate that. And then on his point, I was just going to remember like an arcade is actually where I saw Mortal Kombat for the first time, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's, you just walk in and you see it. And kids are allowed, that's, kids are invited there. So. Yeah, finish him. All right, let's move on. <laughs> um, so the court here applies um, strict scrutiny. And as you know, when you apply strict scrutiny, the government probably loses, right? 
they must identify an actual problem in need of solving. It's not sure that there might be causation, I'm sorry, correlation. It's sure there's an actual problem that's being solved. Okay? And this is an over, over-inclusive statute and under-inclusive statute. And the psychological studies they have are not adequate. Okay? Therefore, this law cannot survive strict scrutiny. By the way, Justice Kagan, who joined the majority opinion, she said in a speech in 2011 that this was a case I struggled with the most. Um, she said, you understand why the government wants to do this and the kind of dangers they're worried about, but she said it's not consistent with the First Amendment precedents. She said she sweated over the case mightily, whatever it's worth. All right, who am I up to next? Uh, Joyce, you next? Yes. Joyce, walk me through Justice Alito's uh, concurring opinion with the Chief Justice. The statute would have a problem or the games would have the problem? I mean the games, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Joyce, where does Alito disagree with the majority, right? Where, where's the disagreement? Oh, he talks about um, technology and how that will have a different effect on, I guess, them getting to play. Yeah, uh, Alito is a lot less certain about the difference between video games and books. He's like, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but I don't know. And he said, when we're moving into this new area, we shouldn't be so aggressive. We should have a more slow, deliberate approach. And what that means is he would give the government some more leeway to enact laws to deal with emerging problems. But Alito's grievance really is about the nature of the statute. He says, this is too damn vague, right? One of the aspects of the 14th Amendment's due process clause is that laws must be specific. You have to know what's prohibited. So one of the problems with the obscenity cases is it was never defined, which is why the Miller test was somewhat helpful. Here, they define maiming, gagging, violence, right? It's a lot of conduct that might fall into it, and you don't know exactly what the standard is. The definition of violent video game, he says, so Alito's opinion is actually based on the 14th Amendment's due process clause, not really the First Amendment, although the First Amendment bleeds into the vagueness as well. He says the statute is well-intentioned, but it's not framed precise enough. And then he goes on this long rant about where he disagrees with the majority. I think we already did that. So any questions on the Alito dissent? Or I always, I always say it's a dissent, but it's not. It's concurring in judgment, but it's basically a dissent from the majority. Yeah, John. Right, I mean, that goes back to Colby's point, right? Are we going to start demanding that legislatures have PhDs in statistics and psychology to, to precisely define? Uh, if you remember a case from Con Law 2 called Craig v. or Con Law, uh, the second half called Craig v. Boren, which was about um, whether uh, the state could sell beer to uh, 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 girls at 18 versus guys at 21. And the majority by Justice Brennan said you need to have some sort of proof about why it is differential in ages. And then Rehnquist wrote his dissent saying we don't want members of the legislature to have a PhD in statistics. And I think Alito is channeling the Rehnquist dissent from Craig V. Boren here. Yeah, Nathan? I found it kind of interesting how Alito was saying, uh, you know, books are different from uh, video games or production, but then uh, going back to uh, his comments to uh, Kagan when she was Solicitor General arguing before her mm -hmm. how uh, uh, he was applying this, this statute for, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Citizens United. Yep. 
about the videos, how uh, he was comparing the video to the books then he, because uh, the statute said that they could, or the government made the argument that they could you know, ban books based off that as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. You're in a tough spot when you want to ban books, right? So Leo's saying books are different. So you have to make that distinction. Anyone else? Yeah, Noel? The only thing that I thought about when I um, was kind of idea of kind of taking it easy and, you know, tippy-toeing into it and not go into it so aggressively was that it just doesn't seem to coincide with the, most of the decisions. And I don't want to generalize about all Supreme Court decisions, but it just seems like most of the, of the trend is to like swing far to one right or and swing far to another direction, and then it kind of chips away and mm -hmm. ends up somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like a process, but I think that he's trying to do it from from the get go and kind of control that process, mm -hmm. and um, it, it sort of happens on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Anyone else on Lido? Yeah, Brian. Well, I just have a comment in general. I've actually read some studies recently um, of thousands of participants that said there's no correlation whatsoever yeah. between incre increased aggressive behavior and violent video games. Yeah, it's all, it, it, it's, it, it, I think one from like one month ago. Yeah, I, I saw that. Like a thousand participants from Oxford. Yeah, so, so I mean, but I think Alito responds, okay, California's wrong, let them repeal the law, right? Don't make the courts do it, let the science play itself out first. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the the more I learn about these sort of childhood studies is people, it's, it's not going to matter. Thin. Yeah, it's, it's a very thin connection between playing these games. Lots of responsible law students taking my class who play the violent, gory video games. Yeah, and I, I have no hand-eye coordination. I can't. If you take me to an arcade, I'll just lose all my quarters very, very quickly. This all cost 25 cents, right? No. No. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I can maybe play Tetris, but I'm not very good at that either. The spatial coordination is like bad. Pong, maybe. Maybe if I try. All right, anything else on Thomas? I'm sorry, Alito? Uh, who's next? Andrew next? Yeah. Walk me through the Thomas one. Again, this Justice Thomas, just he, he always just comes out of left field. Maybe it's right field. But like he just, it's like, this wasn't briefed, right? No one briefed the issue of rights, but he just, he's very idiosyncratic. Yeah. He, to me, kind of went on like this long-winded thing that freedom, like an adult doesn't necessarily have the freedom to speak to a minor. Someone else's. Someone else's yes. child yes. without first getting permission from the parent. Yes. And he cited a couple cases in there, um, <laughs> right at the front, and then we're just, we're that, I guess there was grounds on his, um, for his argument, but it's like, that's essentially what it boiled down to. You, like the First Amendment was never, um, it, it was never, or it was always uh, interpreted to mean that you couldn't talk to someone else's ch child without going through their, their. Yeah, and yeah. That's so I, why he would uphold it because it requires. Well, he, he attacks the argument saying like the bill would require the parent to buy the game for the child. Yeah, do you remember the phrase in loco parentis? Did you ever hear that phrase, right, where the state basically assumes the role of the parent? Mm -hmm. Thomas believes that firmly. Um, so if there's any case involving a speech right at school or a, a search at school, Thomas basically says children have no rights, period, end of sentence. If the school wants to search them, they're going to search them because the government's acting in loco parentis. If the school wants to punish a student who misbehaves, that's fine because the government's acting in loco parentis, and can, they can use the same discipline that a, that a, that the parent would. Um, so Thomas, again, is very idiosyncratic here. Andrew? One other thing I, I did actually have something on um, Alito's opinion. One thing that kind of, it almost disturbed me a little bit, <laughs> that we should just let the, the science work itself out. Alito, you're saying, or Thomas? Alito. Alito, okay. Um, I, on, I got flashbacks to, way, to where um, you used to have all these like, racial stereotypes, when there would be some crap science that said, you know, oh, this race is this, but yeah, and it's, I got a lot of flashbacks of that, and so when, as soon as I read it, I was just like, nah. I got in trouble a couple years ago, I think if you were in my class, when I did the hashtag science thing, when we did Buck v. Bell. Yeah. Uh, when people give me science, they should, it's like, okay, whatever, uh, because it's probably wrong. I, I, again, it's, um, it, but think of the alternate, right? 
if we're saying we're not going to believe scientists, I mean, the judges can decide the policy. Is that much better? These are people insulated. They live in Washington, D.C. They have law clerks who went to Harvard and Yale. They're in a very small sliver of society. Are they in a better place to make policy than are people who are actually elected and run from office and come from different parts of the, of the state? So, I mean, yeah, I, I, get the, I, get the, I get the inclination not to buy science because it could be bullshit. Yeah. But um, the alternative yeah, might, might be worse that you actually have... Yeah, the alternative might be worse where judges who have zero exposure to reality are the ones making decisions, right? So, I, you got to see both sides. Yeah, Gabe. So, uh, the name of his dissent, he says that the Constitution cannot succeed in securing the liberty to seek to protect unless we can raise future generations mm -hmm. uh, to make our system of government work. What is, where is he going by that? Say it again one more time, please. He's saying our Constitution cannot succeed in securing the liberty it seeks to protect unless we can raise future generations. Oh, I think what he's saying is that the state has an interest in raising minors to have a certain character. Unless we let the state instill that character, we can't keep our republic. I think that's what he's getting. I never actually focused on that passage before, but I think that's what he's getting at. You know, think of like Meyer v. Nebraska, where they banned the teaching of foreign languages to kids. They said, we want them to be Americans, right? We want them to speak English. Right, they're trying to instill a new generation of Americans with certain moral character, moral fiber. Yeah, Carl? Yeah, I think earlier when you asked me, would it be okay if the state had law, the state had a thing? The reason I struggle with this is because, to me, it wouldn't matter if the state had a law, right? Because I would want to be in there to participate to, for me to judge. But what if you can't? What if you, you're a working dad and your, your kid can stay at home by himself with a babysitter and you can't be there all the time? But this, this is Breyer's point. He says, what happens for parents who are working, for example, and they need to leave their kids to take the bus home from school and they can't watch them all the time? The state steps in where the parent can't supervise. He would have to wait until I can get there to, for me to accompany him. No, no, but, but what if there's some other kids who don't have that sort of doting father who, who has that sort of relationship? Well, no, no, but, no, but what, what? But you can't control everything. Right. But, but why can't they say try and help out parents, right? Because if you say, son or daughter, I will take you to the store and buy you the game, you don't need the statute. But for parents who aren't present in the same way that your loving father are, right. you may need the state to help in, local parentis, right, to, to do what the state can't. Jesse? Well, in your case, you have a seven-year-old child, but this is statutory. Yeah. Why can't the state say, okay, you have to be there? Yeah. I am 16 going on. John? Because having the law in the books makes it less subjective and more, or makes it less subjective and more objectively wrong. Like it's a law in the books, so it must be right. So even if I was a swing parent, I was like, I don't know. Now there's a law against it. Yeah, if you see, if you're a parent, you see this label on this, maybe that's not such a good idea. All right, I want to do the last case. I'm going to do Breyer quickly. Breyer based the exposition I just gave to Carl that if the state wants to help out parents who can't always be present at the store, they should and that the state should defer. Uh, Breyer's essence is balancing. He loves balancing because he hates strict scrutiny. He never will even use the word. He refuses to. And for him, it's all about balancing costs and benefits. And here he said, by the way, Breyer's wife is a psychologist. And in this case, he had this long appendix of all these studies showing links between video games and violence. All debunked 10 years later, perhaps. But he had this, oh my god, this long appendix, which I, I, it's not in your book, thankfully. All right, anything else on Breyer? Or just as Breyer? Okay. Let's do the last case. Um, was anyone here when, the, when, when Simon Tam came to South Texas? Who saw him? A couple of you, yeah. So we actually, this, guy, this guy's a character, Simon Tam. He actually like, emailed me out of the blue, and he says, hey, I want to come to South Texas and we'll be in Dallas. Can I have a lecture to class? I'm like, yeah, sure, that's great. He's like, yeah, by the way, my fee is like five grand. I'm like, yeah, no, go, go ahead. And then he went and emailed the dean directly, and then the dean said, sure, come on. So he actually gave a concert, which they paid for, but of course, his band, bus, his band bus broke down. It's the most like, cliche thing in the world. Uh, so it was just him. He flew here, and his musicians never came, so he just gave a lecture. Uh, but he's a nice guy. Uh, and I'll do the facts. We're running a little bit short on time. Uh, the Slants are an Asian-American dance rock band. Uh, the music is dreadful. Just check the YouTube page. My goodness. I, I couldn't even listen through one song. They, they wrote a song about the Supreme Court, and I couldn't make it through the end. It was so bad. But anyway, look. It, I, that's not what matters for free speech. They wanted a trademark for their name, The Slants. 
Now, let me just make this point briefly. Okay. No one said you can't call yourself the slants, right? You can make your name whatever you want. But what a trademark means is that if someone else puts their, that name on gear or whatever, or merchandise, you sue them for infringement. So even though this was a free speech case, the upshot of this case is it limited free speech. Before this case, any one of us could have used the word slants in commerce and it was fine. But because of this case, if you use the word slants in commerce, you can be sued. So I mean, Simon Tam is like the most unlikely free speech hero because he's trying to shut everyone else up. I'll give you a better example. The Washington Redskins, right, the football team. They have a trademark for the name Washington Redskins. There was litigation parallel to this case trying to cancel their trademark because it was disparaging. And if that suit succeeded, then anyone can print up counterfeit merchandise with the Redskins logo and the Redskins name on it, and it'll be fine. They can't sue. So again, this is a free speech case, but the upshot is it limits who can actually use these phrases, which is almost a, a bizarre, you know, a bizarre implication. Okay. So under the patent trademark laws, the patent office can cancel a trademark or deny a trademark because of the so-called disparagement clause, right? What does that mean? The meaning of the matter in question uh, is found to be disparaging to a certain group. Disparaging to a certain group. Now, what does it mean to be disparaging? It's somewhat open-ended, right? Uh, Gabe, what does it mean for me disparaging? Okay, good. What's derogatory mean? Uh, offensive, maybe? Yeah. The phrase disparaging, derogatory, they seem an awful lot like the phrase offensive. And it doesn't even matter if the person who uses the mark has good intentions. And this part Simon Tan made clear to us. He wasn't there to make fun of Asians. He was using the word slants to reclaim a slur they think others have taken away from him. You know, whether he's right or wrong, I, I don't really care. But this was his mission. He believed this firmly. Um, so initially, they shut down his application for a trademark. And the, they cited a couple pieces of evidence. And this, is, this was funny. He said, we cited some online blogs. And we cited the fact that one of your concerts was canceled because of your name. Now, Simon told me that's not true, right? First off, the website they looked at was, was Urban Dictionary, which is not a good source for anything. That's like worse than Wikipedia, my friends. Do not give me Urban Dictionary. Um, the second source they cited was basically the allegation that their concert was shut down. Simon said that wasn't the case. It got shut down for a different reason. Musicians cancel concerts for lots of reasons. OK. So the court ultimately rules for Simon Tam. But there's one important point. David, what's government speech? They, they sort of allude to this doctrine, right? What does government speech mean? Uh, OK, good. Yeah, good. Speech of the government sanction that the government put Good. Yeah, so David, when the government is speaking as a speaker, is it required to be viewpoint neutral? No. Good. Okay, this is an important point. When the government's speaking, they don't have to be neutral in viewpoint. And there was a case a couple years ago from Texas uh, called the Sons of the Texas Confederacy versus Walker, or the, the Sons of Texas Veterans versus Walker. I think I might have assigned it a couple years, but I can't remember. Um, this involved whether in Texas you could request a license plate with a Confederate flag on it. Right, in Texas, anyone can request a license plate. You put the design, the state prints it for you. And the court held that, no, Texas wasn't required to give this license plate because the license plate was government speech. It was associated with the government. It was a government endorsement of message. And they're not required to viewpoint neutral. Here in Metal v. Tam, the court says the opposite, that the trademark is not government speech. Right? No one who sees the Washington Redskins logo with a little TM next to it, trademark, will think, aha, that's government speech. When you see the cover of the slant CD, you think, ah, oh, that's the slant, it's not the government. So the government speech doctrine here isn't relevant, okay? So therefore, because it's not government speech, there has, to be, there has to be viewpoint neutrality. And this disparagement clause is not viewpoint neutral. 
Speech that's considered non-offensive is fine, but a spe uh, uh, offensive speech is prohibited. So therefore, they find that this offensive standard is not going to work, and that the slant should get their trademark. The court says again and again, Queen Texas versus Johnson, if there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds it itself offensive or disagreeable. Therefore, the disparagement clause is unconstitutional. By the way, this was a much better case than the, Redsk than the Redskins case, right? The Redskins case was coming up at the exact same time as the Slants case, and the court took the Slants case instead. And the Redskins uh, case was put on hold. All right, so any questions on the, oh, by the way, is this a majority opinion? At this time, Scalia had passed away. Gorsuch was not, Gorsuch was confirmed, but he, but he didn't sit for this case, we didn't decide it. So there were only eight justices. Is there a majority opinion here? Why is Alito's opinion listed first before Kennedy's? I don't have an answer for that question. I don't know. Right? There's not a good answer. There were four votes in one opinion. There were four votes in the other opinion. Shrug emoticon, right? Well, well the, the chief justice is, was in the Alito opinion, the first one. But why, why, why does the fact that the Chief Justice is there, I mean, Alita goes first? Uh, a before K? No, he, he probably assigned the case to Yeah, but there's four and four. I guess someone has to go first. That, that, yeah, Andrew, that's my theory also that Roberts was in it. I, that's the best I can come up with. But there's not really a majority here. Um, neither opinion got five votes, so neither is really a precedent. So I don't even know what, what, what to make of this case. Randy didn't want to put it in the book. I thought it was good, but you know, maybe we'll cut it next in the edition. I don't know. All right, so that's the, that's the Alito opinion. Uh, Brittany, where does Justice Kennedy disagree with Justice? Um, I mean, it's also possible that, and this is another theory, is that originally Alito wrote the majority opinion, and then Kennedy wrote a concurring opinion, and then three other people joined him. Right, the vote flipped a little bit, possible. Anyway, so Brittany, where does Justice Kennedy disagree with Justice Alito? Why is their opinion different? Um, about viewpoint discrimination for trademarks. But doesn't Alito say the same thing? Yeah, it's real close. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's real close. I mean. Uh, to be honest, I didn't quite understand what he was getting on about. Yeah, anyone else want to talk about Kennedy? We're a little bit short on time. Marissa, you want to talk about Kennedy for a minute? Where's the disagreement between Kennedy and Alito? It's, 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 it's thin. Yeah, I think, I think Kennedy is very concerned that here the government's punishing speech because it's unpopular. Um, and that you shouldn't have the government remo removing certain viewpoints from the public sphere and the public debate. That is real similar to what Justice Alito said. I, again, I, whenever I read this case, I have to go back and forth and try to match a difference, but they're pretty damn close, which is why I think initially Alito may have had the majority. Kennedy wrote a concurring opinion, and then the liberals said, okay, we'll join this instead to deprive it of a majority. I think. I don't know. Anyone else ask anything on, on the Kennedy? All right, so the upshot of this case is that the disparagement clause is unconstitutional, and the government can't punish speech because it's deemed offensive or disparaging. Um, so if there are any doubt about these sort of hate speech laws, uh, and whether they're constitutional, Metal v. Tam suggests not, that you can't punish speech merely because someone might find it offensive or disagreeable. There has to be some other thing to justify the censorship. All right, any other questions on Stevens, on... Schwarzenegger or Brown or uh, Mattel? Anything? No? I will see you all next week. Thank you very much.